Now, why is this interesting? Because this formula will be used by Oslo or any software to reconstruct the wavefront starting from the ray tracing. How, the, how does the software do that? Well, it takes a ray coming from B, it propagates, and it integrates the distance all over there until it reaches a plane. And, it, and then minus the same thing all along the ray here. You've got the optical path difference, and from there you can reconstruct a, a wavefront that is distorted with respect to the reference speed. B was the object position? B was the object position. B is the object. Usually A is on axis and B is on axis. Okay, and why is this also very interesting? Well, it's very interesting because, not only for computer reasons, but because if you do a Taylor expansion of this expression in powers of the actual parameters h, phi, and y, you get the dependencies, the variations of um, the Zeidel aberrations, of, of the various aberrations as a function of these parameters. So you get, by Taylor expansion, you get analytical expressions of the primary aberrations. And so you get the intuition about what it, what it is. Okay? It's not just a, a, a computer with an enter knob and get ray tracing, and it's a mixture of aberrations. No. This, a ta a Taylor expansions of this expression yield uh, a deep intuition of, 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 of what aberrations are. Um, so, at this point, I wanted to show you um, well, I wanted to show you where this comes from because it's not um, it's not mad. Well, if you consider optical path length equal to B J prime B J prime uh, H and you consider the optical path length B P prime J. Yeah. Well this is equal to B G prime plus G prime H, right? And this is B P prime plus N prime P prime K. Okay, so this is B G prime. N prime J prime H is J prime I prime. Plus I prime H. And well here that's basically this. Now this is minus delta. And the thing then is that I prime H is nearly equal to I prime B prime P if you neglect higher order terms. And in the same way, P prime K is nearly equal to P prime B prime P if you neglect higher, term, higher order terms. And it's justified to do so at the order of aberrations that you want to calculate. For this I mean I mean the following, just to be strict. I prime H, for instance. Oh, sorry. Yes, I prime H. 
you consider this triangle here, I prime H, D prime P, is equal to I prime D prime P minus D prime P H. And so in other words, it's this times 1 minus 1 half of D prime P H squared divided by I prime P, I, I, I prime D prime P squared. Now let us consider the orders, the orders of magnitude. B prime P H is within a, a very small angle here. It's the transverse aberration. Okay. Let us call, let us say, B, the transverse aberration is of order P. P is strict, strictly larger than 1. Well, see that it, it will be 3 or 5, third order aberration, fifth order aberration. And this P prime, B, or B prime PH squared is of order 2P. Strictly larger than 2. So, um, this term here is nearly equal to, um, so I mean, 2p, yeah, 2, 2p, so since p will be equal to 3, this will be larger than 6, actually, okay, because p is equal to 3, 5, and so on. Aberrations are, have all odd orders. Okay, so what it means is that you can neglect these terms when you calculate um, I prime H because this um, will prove in, in, in a second that the optical path difference is of order P plus 1. So it, if you take a third order aberration, it means that the wave front, the wave aberration will be of order, of order 4. Okay, in, term, in, in, in powers of the actual parameters, it will be h4, or it will be h3 to, uh, times y, or it will be h squared times y squared, but it will always be uh, Taylor expansions of, uh, of, of power 4. Okay? So, this expression, as shown here, is justified, and it will be used in practice. Now, why is the uh, optical path difference interesting? First of all, because it's it's a quantity a quantity that is conserved through a perfect optical system. If you take an optical system with an incoming wavefront here, suppose this optical system is perfect. I've got an incoming wavefront; it's distorted. This is the corresponding exit wavefront. And now suppose you move a little bit the input wavefront from sigma naught to sigma. For instance, there is a system four that has introduced an extra aberration. Okay. Well, if your system is perfect, then this optical path delay here will be conserved, and you will find it also at the other. End. Of course, it's optical path difference. It's not geometric distance. So that's why here this segment doesn't have the same length, because the twin lengths of the fractions of it can be different. But what is conserved is the n delta. n delta equals n prime delta prime. In free space, delta is conserved around the real world. So this is a constant in your problem. Now, if you have an association, an association of systems and your systems introduce aberrations, then this Goy theorem allows you to sum the n prime i delta i to obtain the wave aberration at the output of your entire system, namely n prime delta prime, 
the total weight aberration is equal to the incoming weight aberration plus the sum of all the weight aberrations, um, the, the, the weight aberration contributions uh, brought by each of the single systems. Okay, so this is why it's interesting because it tells you that the aberrations are additive if you consider the right quantity, the optical band difference. Aberrations are not additive if you consider the transverse aberrations. You can't say that I think system one, system two, system three, I, I, I characterize on the bench in the lab system one, I got this spot. I characterize system two, I get another slot, I put them all together, center them well, and in the end I get the, the sum of all of them. It's more complicated than that, and we'll see why. But what is additive is the optical path difference, and the optical path difference is easily measured using two-way interferometers, like the Zygo, for instance. So in the interferogram, when you do it, if you want it as a function of all parameters, the h, the the angle, and everything, you have to do different wavefronts to get the angle part. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, typically, you would do this. I'm going to draw a piezo interferometer. You would use a laser source, for instance, something that is coherent, spatially and temporally. Okay, you collimate it, and it's a perfect wavefront. Okay, perfect. It's flat, and you use a, a, a separation plate, a beam splitter. You use a perfect flat something that costs a lot, and then you take your optical system that you want to test. And you have light focus, so here it's terrible, you have the ugly point spread function, but you don't look at it yet. You put a very expensive perfect mirror here. A perfect mirror with a, a well-known radius of curvature, such that this total point here is equal to the center of curvature of the mirror. So rays come back on themselves and the perfect mirror, which is stigmatic for its center of curvature, rigorously stigmatic, does not introduce any aberration. Only this one does. It introduces a wave aberration delta. Waves come, 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 will come back on themselves. You, cumul you accumulate a second time the aberration. So here you've got a wavefront that's coming back that is that has twice the wave aberration, and it interferes with with the reference plane. And if you want to test your system totally, what you have to do is you have to uh, rotate your system here so that you can vary field angle or the height of the object, y. So, well, you do it for, well, on axis, and then you do it for various points off axis, okay? And you get several measures, okay? You don't have to do a full study by varying the radius of the iris diaphragm, because this, the, the, as we will see later, the decomposition of the wavefront on a typical polynomial basis will get, tell you what are your aberrations. You don't need to vary it by yourself. Let me illustrate to be very clear what I mean by the OBE is interesting. Let me consider uh, a plano convex lens, diameter 1 inch, focal length 60 millimeter, and you're in the lab and you want to make an afocal telescope. Okay, you want to, to reduce the diameter of your laser beam by a factor of three. 
Okay. What do you do? You open the drawers, take a lens 60 millimeter converging, and then suppose you have a diverging lens on the shelf, you choose minus 20 millimeter, such that you will divide the beam diameter by a factor of three, and there you are. Well, what the Goy theorem tells you is that if you have characterized this lens, which is a, piece, uh, a typical disaster, okay, uh, the uh, P2 valley of this wavefront is 57 lambda. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not simulation. It's, I mean, it is, it, it is the real thing. So it's a disaster. Um, 57 lambda. We'll see that typically you need to be less than lambda. And you associate a diverging lens, minus 20, okay, which is another piece of disaster. Well, what the Goy theorem says is that when you plug in the two of them, you get something sensible, uh, much better. Okay? You get something that is only 13 lambda, which is still a disaster. But it's much better. And so by combining the right lenses, you can eventually cancel the third order aberration, which is the case here. Okay. Now, for those of you who have, um, who do not have uh, a zygo at home to measure their aberrations, um, all you have is basically um, maybe um, a, 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 beam, a beam profile, something that analyzes the, the shape of, of your beam, okay? How big is the spot? Well, it is interesting to understand uh, the intuition of how you go from the optical path difference to the transverse uh, aberrations. And these are the mutual relationships. Mm. So, how do you connect this to that? Again, to make things simple, I'm not going to do a 3D drawing. I'm going to project everything in the plane. Is there a way to connect this delta here and the transverse aberration? The answer is yes. Um, first, I I'm going to, to, to convey some intuition about what, what, where the, the, the formulas come from. Well, consider this a small angle here between the partial ray and the real ray. Epsilon. Actually, epsilon, you should think of it in, 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 in 3D, okay? Because there is, of course, this, I mean, this ray, this actual ray is in the plane, but the red ray is real and it might be off, off the plane, right? So epsilon is not necessarily in the plane. It's epsilon y along in this plane and epsilon x in the other plane. Well, if you look, if you zoom in and you, and you think about this figure here, it's rather intuitive. Epsilon y here is equal to the derivative of delta with respect to a small displacement on the wavefront, d sigma. This is true. For instance, you, 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 you draw a small, you move a little bit on this wavefront here by a quantity d sigma y in this plane. Well, the variation of delta here, when you move a little bit, you see, here I, 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 I plotted an orange small segment, a sphere, also a, 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 another small sphere, a portion of the sphere, okay? And it's tilted with respect to the real wavefront by exactly the same so the, the variation of delta, when you move a little bit on the wavefront, d of delta, is precisely equal to d sigma times epsilon. This is really the, the reason why, in the end, we will find that the wave aberration is a primitive of the transverse aberration. Let me go one step further. 
Um, well, look at this is the, your transverse aberration, okay? Well, dy prime cosine alpha prime, you see, is just this distance. It's, it, it's the projection of dy prime on, uh, on the direction that's going to to the real way. dy prime cosine alpha prime. And this is equal to r times this small angle. It's quite obvious. Okay, do the same thing in the x direction. And use these relationships and you get a relationship between dy prime and the derivative of the optical back difference with respect to the uh, small displacement on the wavefront. Now, what is this small displacement, d sigma? It's nothing else, this small displacement, than r times the variation of alpha prime. And so if you simplify, what you get is a simplified version of the new relationships. The transverse aberration is nothing else to a cosine over, forget about this cosine alpha prime, it's nothing else than the derivative of the optical value. And the same thing is true with respect to the azimuth angle in the x direction. Now, to make things simple, I, I, I did the reasoning in uh, by taking basic, by I did the reasoning by assuming that the, the point M here was in in, in, in in this screen, okay? But it's actually not the case. It's tilted with an azimuth angle of thought. Well, all you have to do is just apply a rotation matrix to, to, to these relationships. And a rotation by an angle phi is nothing else than that. So if you do this and apply it to your uh, previous relationships, you get the full Niebuhr relationships that are here. So you see it's, well, it tells you that it is related to the derivatives of the optical path difference with respect to one, the numerical aperture, alpha prime, and two, the azimuth angle, of phi. Okay? Okay, it's obviously non-linear. So, your intuition of aberration is based on that. Mine is based on that, on the, on the wave aberration now. Earlier, I thought about the transverse aberrations, but it's actually the optical path difference that is here. And based on the wave aberration, Zidal classified the aberrations. Um, so, one can show, it's quite easy, that the wave aberration can be expanded, uh, can be tailor extended in power terms of three things. H squared, the square of the height of the ray in the pupil. Y squared, the square of the height of the object. And a HY cosine phi, the scatter product of the object, which is along axis Y, and P prime M, the uh, height of the M is the impact of the ray in the pupil, and phi is the angle. This is the scatter product, HY cosine. And so you do your expansion, and that's what you get, right? H2 to the power P times Y2, Y squared to the power Q times HY cosine phi to the power M, which you can expand in H y cosine m phi. Okay. Let us now put names on each of these terms. Well, to lowest order, uh, you can think of the terms that are independent of h, terms that are such that 2 plus n is equal to 0. These terms do not depend on h, so they do not depend on the radius of the pupil can be as small as you want, as large as you want, they do not depend. You, the height of 
your object being fixed, they, it's basically a constant. Okay, because p is then equal to zero and m is equal to zero. So these terms are constants, they are really not interesting, they are called pistons. It's basically constants. And by definition they are null because they depend only on your reference sphere. And usually the reference sphere is centered on the paraxial image and intercepts the paraxial, the, the, the exit field. So it's a constant. So let us forget about that, okay? Then, to first order, uh, we've got the h squared term, which is basically n equals zero, q equals zero. Um, this is a defocused term, uh, a defocus with respect to the paraxial plane. It's not interesting, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it because we have to consider this term if we talk about chromatic aberrations. So, hence, I'm talking about it here. What's, wh why do we call the h squared term a defocused term? Because this, this is not so obvious. Well, it's a defocused term. It's not really an aberration. It's a term that comes because you have decided not to put your CCD in the paraxial plane. You made the mistake. And so you, you made this term appear. The optical system is perfect. There are no aberrations. All the rays focus on the paraxial image. But you have defocused your CCD so that actually the rays focus at the point that is defocused by a quantity epsilon and thus they intercept the CCD at the height dy prime and the relationship between dy prime and epsilon is obvious right? tangent alpha now because you did the mistake there's a, a, a difference an optical path difference between your reference sphere where you put the CCD and the real waveform signal and it is related to alpha prime using this relationship to lowest order it is related to this the larger the defocus the larger the optical path difference the larger the numerical aperture and of course the larger the intercept circle now alpha prime Alpha prime is nothing else than h divided by the distance here. Okay, so that's why it's an h squared. Okay, so this this just uh, puts into practice what I've just said. If you take a panoconvex lens and you defocus by five millimeters, you obviously get something that is a circle, homogeneous circle, that is larger than your every spot. And actually, using the Nibu uh, relationships, you, di you, you differentiate this with respect to alpha prime and phi, it doesn't depend on phi, and you get this, which is the radius of your circle. Okay, well this is obvious, but I'm going to talk a little bit of it when we talk about chromatic aberrations. Now, let's talk about the other term that is of order 2, the one that is h well, p equals zero, q equals zero, m equals one. That's this kind of term. Can we understand in the same way what this term comes from? This term is actually a tilt. It's a tilt by an angle beta with respect to the uh, paraxial image point. Again, you made a mistake. Your camera is in the right plane but you did not configure correctly the magnification the numerical magnification of your camera you made a, a, a mistake such that the height of the image is actually um, not to the scale I mean it's y prime equals y prime p plus a small error. 
by a factor k. k might be small, but still, if you make the scaling there, then it means that your reference sphere is here, and your paraxial image is here, shifted by dy prime, which is proportional to y prime. Well, now, what's the relationship between delta here and beta? Well, it's quite obvious, right? You just shifted this sphere. You just, not shifted, tilted this sphere by the, by the angle beta. And thus, delta is just beta times the height of impact in the pupil. So it's beta times h cos phi. So this shows that this term is a tilt term. Basically, what it means is that I've drawn a small picture here. That's picture a tree. Okay. The real image is red, but because of your fault, well, the magnification is wrong by 10%, and thus uh, this is your reference image in orange dashed. Well, if you calculate the, uh, the optical path difference due to the difference between these two spheres, it is equal to this. Just a quick question. Uh, yeah. When you say this is a tilt area, you mean the actual optical system relative to the object? No, 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 no. I just mean what I what I said. I, I said a magnification error. Okay. For instance, um, you made a, mister, uh, a mistake on the size of the pixel. You didn't read the manual correctly. It was written 13 micrometer, and you thought it was 10. So that's a 30% error. And, it's, and, it, and, and what it says is that you think your image is 30% 30, 30 smaller than, than, than it is, or larger. Well, OK? So it's an error that is linear with the field, y, with the height of the object. Okay? This is the, the error you make has nothing to do with real tilts or real objects. Okay? But it is equivalent, as I said, it is equivalent to having your reference sphere tilted with respect to the real sphere, spherical wavefront. So, so yeah. um, it seems like that's going to be a magnification only in one dimension. Yeah, sure. But in your picture of the tree, you've shown Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. When, you're, when you're doing the image of a tree, uh, until now, the top of the tree was B. Why? Okay. Well, this point here means you have a Y that is in the other direction. Okay. When you take a, when you take the picture of a landscape, okay. All my objects are called Y. I mean, uh, I, 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 my convention is I take the object like this, and I look where, like you, you're looking at the spot diagram, where are the, array, the intersect points? Now, if you rotate here, I rotate everything, right? So I just, that's why. They made the, this angle in the object plane is arbitrary. The only thing that counts, in other words, is the relative angle between the object and the height of, uh, and the intercept point in the pupil. So is this going to be different radially as opposed to uh, tangentially? No. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, Uh, I did, uh, that's a good question. Well, what, it, what it triggers is, I didn't say at the beginning why I chose these conventions. Okay. So, let me explain. We've got an optical system that is centered. I have chosen arbitrarily axes. And you propose that I take an object here. Not necessarily on this end, on this axis. Take rays that intersect total with well, let me call phi zero like object 
phi of this angle. And let me call psi this angle. The only thing that counts since this, the orientation of this axis was arbitrary, you chose it. The only thing that counts, oh yeah, I have it. The only thing that counts is psi minus phi zero, because I can redefine an axis y1, x1 that are rotated by phi. The only thing that counts is this. And in the aberration terms, the only thing that counts is h, y1, cosine, psi minus phi zero. OK? h in this, y1 in this, this, cosine, psi minus phi zero. So, the convention was arbitrary since the beginning. So that's why I put everything in the plane of the board. Okay, I did the expansion. And I've given an interpretation of this first order term that we call the tilt. And if you want to analyze the tilt associated to this point here, just rotate everything. Call this y1. Okay, and, and between this orange point here, and the red point here, you have a small tilt that corresponds to a 10% error. In so, so this is a stigmatic error. This is a, sti no, a stigmatic error, not an astigmatic error. What do you call an astigmatic that, Just uh, error that's different in one dimension as opposed to another. Well, yes, of course, but, 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 but it's a scaling error. That's the same in all directions. It's a scaling error. You may, it, it, it means that your pixel, in the manual it's written that the pixels are squarish 13 by 13, and you made the same mistake in the two directions. You thought it was 10 by 10, and it's squarish. Okay. Okay. So, um, well, to summarize what I've said and give you some, um, some, some, some three-dimensional vision of aberrations, of the two first terms at least. Well, this is the defocus term, it's a parabola, as a function of um, h cos phi and h sin phi, which are the two coordinates Y, capital Y, and capital Z. Uh, the spot here has a radius equals to alpha prime marginal times the uh, focus epsilon. And if you divide by 2 the diameter of your iris diaphragm, you divide by 2 the diameter of your spot. <coughs> this is what I illustrate here by going from light green to dark green. I divide by 2 the diameter of the iris there. We'll see that it's not the case with other aberrations. The tilt, what it means is that your wave front, your wave front error, your wave, your wave aberration is not zero. It's tilted. So this is typically what it would look like on, on, the, uh, on an interferometer. What it means is that you made a scaling error uh, that is linear. So, so it's an error that's linear with the field. OK. Um, to conclude for lecture one, before we go to the uh, ge geometrical aberrations, the other side of uh, terms, I would like to mention the chromatic aberrations because they are, of course, related to what I said. Primary chromatic aberrations, this name for chromatic aberrations, primary chromatic aberrations, are by definition obtained by varying linearly the paraxial quantities with lambda. So you have two kinds of chromatic aberrations. The aberrations 
along the axis and the aberrations transversal. Along the axis, what does it mean? It means that basically, uh, well, I think I have a picture here. Yeah. Take a lens. You know that if you send a collimated white, uh, collimated white light through the lens, the red light will focus not at the same point as the blue light. And if you look in the plane where the red light focuses, you will find a blue disk. This is what I illustrate here. The red sphere focuses in this plane. This is the paraxial red image. Of course, the blue rays do not focus at the same point, and thus you get the blue halo surrounding the red image. Well, this, although the, the system, uh, so, so what it means is that the, 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 the red wave front is a sphere. The blue wave front is also a sphere, but both of them don't have the same radius of curvature. And one is defocused with respect to the other by a quantity epsilon, so it's exactly an application of what I said before. And the wave aberration between the red sphere and the blue sphere is equal to this, and you can estimate it using the formulas I've shown before. The second kind of chromatism is transverse chromatism, or also called lateral color. So this one is called primary axial color, PAC, also. And this one is called primary lateral color, PLC. I've drawn here an example of what happens if you illuminate a singlet by collimated white light at an angle of one degree. Well, one degree is small. Well, then it's a disaster. It's a disaster if... Well, it's not a disaster if you put the pupil on the lens. It's a disaster if you put the pupil at a certain distance away from the lens. So I'm not going into the details. You can read later. Um, but um, what primary lateral color means is that the, basically the, re the ray that goes through the center of the pupil is not deviated by the same amount, whether it's red or blue. And thus, well, in this case, you have two things. You have the actual color, which triggers the halo, the blue halo. But it triggers a second thing, is that the blue halo is shifted. It's not shifted, it's tilted in terms of, of, of the vocabulary I introduced before. And it, this tilt here yields to a halo that's shifted by, by this quantity here, which is dramatically high. So I, I can take something extraordinary out to the lens that I mean, this shift here does not depend on the size of the pupil, so you can take whatever the diameter you want, but its focal length is like this, and I put the pupil exactly at the position that is corresponds to the objective of the point. Okay? So, pupil here, lens here, typical elements you use in the lab. And this is what you get. Again, red is for red is 656 nanometer, and blue is 486. So, well, you can adapt this to your wavelengths. Okay, 780 and Okay, well, uh, I think I will stop here and keep going in uh, half an hour.